Okay, welcome back everyone. So I'm going to hand over um, to our chair. Sue Barker has very kindly um, stayed on the line listening to the clinking of glasses and people getting plates of morning tea. Uh, so apologies, Sue. I will hand over to you to um, introduce Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Can you, I can hear you, Sue. Can you hear me? Oh, that's great. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Oh, good. Okay. Excellent. So, Sue, so I think we've got our IT all working. I'll hand over to you to chair our wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, tēnā koutou katoa. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to chair this panel on change and charity law. How well does the conceptual architecture of the law of charity respond to social, economic and cultural change? And how might it be changed to better respond? We have three excellent uh, speakers. Um, C. King is, uh, I'll introduce them all together now if, uh, if that suits. C. King is a partner with uh, Milner and Huang Lawyers for the uh, Lawyers for the For Purpose Sector. C. King has over 30 years experience as a lawyer and draws especially on her experiences, for example, as General Counsel and Company Secretary of World Vision Australia. C. King is the current Chair of the Charities and Not-for-Profits Committee of the Law Council of Australia's Legal Practice Section. She is also a Director of Clans and two Australian registered charities. She's also a member of the ACNC's Advisor Forum and the ATO's Not-for-Profit Stewardship Group. Uh, after we've heard from C. King, we'll hear from Marla Cohen, who is a senior so associate with Herbert Smith Freehills in Melbourne. After working in tax at Allen's Linklaters, Marla began her charity law career at the ACNC, where she worked as legal counsel during the first four years of the ACNC's establishment. Marla gained further regulatory and tax experience as a director at the ATO, and while in that role, undertook a secondment as manager of the not-for-profit advice team at Justice Connect. Uh, at Herbert Smith Freehills, Marla advises on a broad range of issues affecting charities. And following Marla, we will hear from Joanna Austin, who has led the in-house legal team at the ACNC since late November 2019. Joanna started her career at Gaydon's Lawyers in Sydney before joining the New South Wales Crime Commission as a lawyer in law enforcement and integrity agencies. She then worked with the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission in Sydney before moving to Melbourne in 2013 to take up a role at the independent broad-based anti-corruption commission. Joanna holds a Master of Arts and a Bachelor of Laws from the University of New South Wales and was admitted to practice as a lawyer in 2003. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming C. King uh, as our first speaker. of his book. Thank you, Bridget. Yeah. So my task is really just to make some general observations this morning, you know, about how well our present set of laws has responded to what he called a fluid landscape and how might it be changed to respond better. I'm going to draw on the PBI as an example. 
um, because that was what I was asked to do. And also because very topically in front of everyone's minds at the moment is, of course, the redraft of the Commissioner's Interpretation Statement on the PBI. But I'm going to look at that really just as examples. Um, the Law Council Charities and Not-for-Profit Committee's working group on that has not really finished its task. So please don't think that what I have to say is the sum total, you know, so of what our observations are. So anyway, where did this body of rules come from, you know, this conceptual architecture? A piece that I really enjoyed reading to prepare for today was actually Matthew Harding's 2020 article, um, Charity and Law, Past, Present and Future. Thank you, Matthew. You know, so um, in this, he reminds us that, that the 1601 statute was enacted against a backdrop of rapid and far-reaching upheavals then in society following the English Reformation. He describes the preamble as a legislative snapshot, just a snapshot, of philanthropic concerns of the times animated by an anxiety of a poor relief and community responsibilities. How true that is. And then in a romp through history, which you can do since then, we can see laws and cases relating to the concept of the legal charity shaped by social, economic and cultural changes. So we had the Mott Main Act of 1746, which was really enacted with a desire to protect the interests of heirs. And because of that, you know, courts actually expanded you know, um, recognition of different types of charitable purposes because if something was for a charitable purpose, then it was void under that legislation. <clears throat> Couldn't be devised a way for um, community benefit, for public benefit, as we would say today. The backdrop of Pamsel's case, which gave us the four heads of charitable purposes, was the Napoleonic um, Wars, which compelled the imposition of income tax but provided for um, exemptions for corporations, fraternities or societies or persons who were established or involved in charitable purposes. The cases establishing public benefits requirement came about um, because of you know, a desire to recognise um, that charitable purpose should be for public benefit and be beneficial to people. The requirement for charity to be not-for-profit arose when corporations and associations with members became popular. Presently, we see the idea of grassroots, you know, charity organisations. And of course, the PBI is a creature of a time when there was a need to encourage public donations in Australia, and it involved a decision to adopt a different test to the test of charity. And then today we have the preamble to the ACNC Act states that it is necessary for a whole range of reasons to establish a commissioner of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission who will focus on the not-for-profit sector and will recognise and respond to the diversity and uniqueness of the sector. So we could pause there and say our present laws have actually evolved remarkably well, reflecting changes and expectations over time. But what can we observe of the present? A theme that keeps emerging if we look back at history is that the laws and cases at various times show us that there will be an expansive view of what is charity, and at certain times, a narrow view has dominated. In the key case of the PBI, we can continue to see that because we're still in a period of tension between regulators, the ATO previously and now the ACNC, who we observe take a narrow view. And on the other hand, for charities, practitioners and courts in cases who have in fact been taking a far more expansive view for a while now. So we see the ACNC take a narrow view you know, about what constitutes a PVI when we observe as practitioners like myself outside, admittedly, you know, when we observe its approach to PBIs that it has been undertaking, we see it in its reaction to cases, 
We see it in the current PBI Commissioner's Interpretation Statement. We see it too in the proposed redraft. Um, the LCA Charities and Not-for-Profits Committee have raised a number of points about the current PBIS in um, PBI, um, CIS, sorry, in a submission to the ACNC in September 2020. And many of those points we think remain valid, you know, for the purposes of the redraft that's currently in consultation. So I just want to draw out three things from that. We say that the CIS needs to expand on the concept of people in need in the modern context and clarify the cohorts to whom that concept applies. We question whether it is appropriate to continue to define need by reference to those who arouse community compassion. And if it is, how do we, what is the parameters of that test and how do we apply it? We say that it will be beneficial for the PBI CIS to be updated to articulate that prevention activities are also benevolent. That's modern charity, is it not? That's modern PBI, isn't it? You know, we already have development assistance provided by organizations that do work overseas, you know, recognized because they, pre they are preventative, they stop certain needs from arising, and they are also relief because they relieve the needs of people who are assisted. Why not have that view consistently also for those organized, um, organizations carry out activities onshore? We say too that the PBI CIS should provide more guidance on when Indigenous community development activities in the form of economic development address Indigenous disadvantage and whether they are sufficiently targeted towards those in need. Ian Murray has done a lot of work and has published in this area. He considered the activities of prescribed bodies corporate that hold or manage native title rights for Indigenous communities. We say that while in these organizations, there will be economic benefits flowing to individuals. This is usually not a purpose, but rather a means to relief of disadvantage. Then of course, we've had the global citizen um, position, which recognized an organizations which exist to address systemic causes of global poverty through advocacy, and we also see the ACNC somewhat narrow view of that position, confining it to its facts and not drawing principles that we think can usefully be drawn from it off the back, not just of that case alone, but the hunger project decision and apply those principles more broadly. So where to from here and how might we change laws for the better? Charity law must continue to evolve. I began by saying that, and it must continue to be shaped by the changes that we see around us. Because addressing the most difficult and challenging needs our society has never been more urgently needed. That's a very personal view of mine. It's also why I work in this sector. You know, so the ways in which our charities respond to social issues need to modernize. We need to free them up to be able to do that. You know, and I'm thinking about digital poverty. You know, we have in our present PBI CIS, I'm still amused by a statement that, you know, PBI should not provide luxury items. And then I think about when the, the, the term digital poverty first came, when I first became aware of it, it was about 10 years ago. And all of us have lived through the pandemic and we all know about the inequity of digital poverty right in our community, children who don't have device, the right devices for school online, you know, so, um, so that's just an example, you know, so organizations need to increasingly work with a network of others because no one has all the skills and all the knowledge and all the capabilities anymore. Technology disrupts and should disrupt how um, aid and relief is deployed. In the international development space, the push for localization, which began 15 years ago, I think, which is about building capacity locally. So the likes of our INGOs don't just go over there and have our people doing the work on the ground, but it is about building capacity up on the line. 
has now had a sharper imperative under the banner of decolonization, much, much sharper. You know, so, and if I can be really blunt about it, decolonization is about get out of the way, let us. And we too, we've heard that from Monica very loudly this morning. You know, so, yeah. Are we allowed to do all that? You know, I hear you ask, and my response to this is yes. You know, so I think in the case of the a ACNC, we've heard that from Sue Barker as well, uniquely among charity regulators in the Western jurisdictions, an object of the ACNC Act is to support and sustain a robust, vibrant, independent and innovative not-for-profit sector. This is a call for modernity in our legislation, is it not? If you look at what the full court or the federal court had to say in the Hunger Project, they too encourage us towards modernity in how we understand the term PBI. There was, they looked at substance over form and they had this to say, whilst past judicial statements concerning the ordinary meaning of a word or experience or expression can often assist in divining the meaning of the word or expression, the common understanding of the meaning of an expression may change over time, depending on the particular expression in question. When the question is whether a particular institution is a public benevolent institution, the answer depends on the common and ordinary understanding of the expression at the relevant time. The question is not to be approached as a legal question to be dealt with by the mechanical application of past authority, irrespective of the present current understanding of the expression in the, in the currently spoken English language. There you have it. There are some who say we should wait more for some more from the courts, that there should be more test cases. But we've heard this morning about cost of litigation and where is that test case funding gonna come from? But fundamentally, I think depending on the courts, that's a very slow and ad hoc way of effective change. You know, so, and we already, like I said, have quite a number of cases from which we can draw principles. I just don't think that we have necessarily been great at drawing them all out and applying them, you know, in the modern context. Much of the spotlight on PBI is, of course, because it is the form of charity that attracts all the charitable tax concessions and exceptions that are currently available. And perhaps, and we heard that this morning too, issues will all go away if we just flatten it all and give everyone a DGI endorsement. And I know right there I need to say we need to solve the FBT issue as well. You know, so this is just one of the major areas of law reform. You know, we need, I think, boldness to actually get on with that. You know, so it has been recommended on several occasions. Might we see it happen soon? That question has been asked over and over again. You know, so. And then there is also the view that the PBI is passed its use by date, no longer fit for purpose in contemporary Australia, and that it will increasingly give rise to further inequity, complexity. Look where we are today. You know, so reasons for this include that for a significant section of the public, and probably for the majority of the Australian community, the words PBI and the requirement that those needing its aid should arouse pity and compassion is paternalistic and reflects an outdated view about disadvantage and disability and how we address that. So I want to finish there. It's a little bit irony, isn't it, to talk about abolition perhaps of the PBI because that I think would really reflect social, economic, and cultural change and expectations. Thank you. Thank you so much, C. King. Um, very thought-provoking um, uh, discussion. And uh, I'd like to pass over now to Marla Cohen. Thank you, Sue. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And if I can just apologise to everyone in advance, if I do cough through some of the presentation, it's not COVID, but I've had a lingering cough and the doctor assures me it's not contagious, but I think just um, having a two-year-old, these things are inevitable. 
Um, and thank you so much, C. King, for that wonderful presentation. I think it really framed the issue well and um, there were many points about that, about how charity law is very well positioned to respond to changes in society um, and that the courts have constantly emphasised the evolving nature of charity law. Um, but what I wanted to look at, if I can get my slides working, um, is what happens in practice. Uh, what does it mean in practical terms? And does the law of charity in fact evolve in the way that it's supposed to? And a practical issue that's already been touched on um, today is that charities don't tend to have the will or the resources to litigate. And I say resources because it's not always a financial consideration or not only a financial consideration, although that will often be determinative, but also a question of where the charity wants to direct its time and energy. And of course, litigation is a very lengthy process and time preparing for court is time away from pursuing, for, from pursuing the charity's purpose. So because of this, court decisions are few and far between. And so the question of whether charity law remains modern and relevant largely depends on how the regulator executes its role. Must it wait for judicial authority before construing charitable purposes through a modern lens? Or can it take a more proactive role in the evolution of charity law, relying on the principle-based nature of charity law, rather than being confined to the few factual scenarios that the courts have considered? And I think that this perhaps goes to Anna's comment earlier today, that it's not the regulator's role to change the law. And the question is, what does changing the law mean in the context of charity law where courts have consistently stated the principle that charitable purpose must be construed through a modern lens. So to attempt to answer this question, I'd like to start by talking about the well-established charitable purpose of advancement of education. And in particular, how continuing professional development or CPD, a relatively new form of education, is playing a more and more crucial role in modern society. And because of its importance, CPD is becoming increasingly regulated. That discussion will lead me to talk about how charity law views the purpose of regulation, and in particular, how the UK charity regulator responded to changing ideas about regulation. And just to give you a teaser here, the commission registered a charity that the courts had previously said was not charitable, largely on the basis of changed social and economic circumstances. So with that roadmap in mind, let's talk about education and more particularly CPD. And I'm sure many of you like me are getting a head start here on your substantive requirements. Although if you're like me, that's never the issue. And it's always the last three that I'm scrambling to get done in those last few stressful days of March. Um, but the question is, are we obtaining a professional benefit for these sessions, which is incompatible with charitable purpose? Now it's uncontroversial that education necessarily provides a benefit to the beneficiaries of those, that education, and that's really the point of it. But it's always been understood that this type of private benefit is incidental to the broader public benefit. There's a recognition that there's an intrinsic value in society of having an educated population. Or put another way, there is a public good in the pursuit of knowledge. As the UK Charity Commission's guidance on the slide confirms, Receiving an education is not a relevant private benefit. And courts certainly don't look into the subject matter of the education to decide whether it's directed towards private rather than public benefit. With that in mind, let's move on to CPD. And just for some context here, my firm successfully obtained charity registration for various professional associations in the past on the basis that they were advancing education through their CPD programs or, or, and or that they were advancing the particular industry as a subset of advancing trade and commerce, which is itself, of course, a recognised charitable purpose. But in the last couple of years, there seems to have been a shift at the ACNC and we are having applications rejected for substantially similar organisations, with CPD being one of the issues raised particularly where the subject matter of the CPD relates to financial matters or matters pertaining to running a business. Is there something inherently different about CPD that somehow elevates the private or professional benefit to unacceptable levels? 
or is the fact that CPD requirements are sometimes there and to enable professionals or certain professions to practice relevant? Or is the issue with the body that provides the education so that it's okay if it's done by an educational institution such as occurred in the College of Law cases, but not so if it's a professional association? But if that's the issue, it seems contrary to decisions which have held that education is not confined to education provided by schools or universities. And certainly the surgeon's case involved a professional association found to be a charity with the purpose of promoting or advancing surgical knowledge and practice and as such a scientific institution. Now, in its reasoning, the ACNC often refers to a New Zealand decision, the New Zealand Computer Society case, which Sue has already mentioned today and noted the evidentiary constraints in relation to that case and how it's fundamentally inconsistent with Australian authorities. But um, it does, what the quote, sorry, the quote that um, is often um, set out in the decisions is, is set out there. And essentially it says that um, CPD, when it's provided by professional associations, is for the advancement of a, a particular profession. And this, I think, illustrates the basis of the ACNC's concern. There's an assumption that continuing education, if undertaken by a professional association, is for the advancement of professional interests and not for the advancement of education for the public benefit. Now, putting to one side whether that is even consistent with how private benefit should be assessed in the context of education, given the topic at hand, I wanted to briefly talk about CPD and how it's viewed in modern society. So the Victorian Legal Services Board has noted that now more and more industries are recognising the importance of CPD for the protection of the public. In December 2014, a parliamentary committee recommended mandatory CPD requirements for the financial services industry, noting that initial education must be supplemented by meaningful CPD. And I think there's a sense here about how fast paced our society is becoming and how knowledge is increasingly or is constantly evolving and as such CPD becomes increasingly important. Now there were also statements in the recent Banking Royal Commission and the Lawyer X Royal Commission about the importance of CPD for ensuring proper advice is given and for protection of the public and I hope you'll excuse me for using the colloquial names there but I worry that if I use the full title it would significantly eat into my 10 minutes. But clearly there is a growing recognition that CPD is for the public benefit. And this has resulted in increased regulation of CPD, that is mandatory CPD requirements for certain industries. And that brings me to the last part of my talk, which is about regulation in the context of charity law. And in particular to an example of how the UK regulator responded to change social and economic circumstances to reinterpret the purpose of regulation. So the story begins in the UK in 1928, where Queen Elizabeth was two years old and also no doubt passing on coughs to her parents. And a statutory body, the General Medical Council or GMC, sought recognition as a charity. GMC's functions are set out on the slide, but they essentially relate to regulating the medical profession. And the Court of Appeal in the UK decided that GMC was not a charity because the regulation of the medical profession was in large part for the professional advantage or benefit of those in the profession. Presumably, the main benefit of the regulation was the right to practice, which was a significant professional advantage. As such, GMC's regulatory purpose was not charitable because it was not only directed to the public benefit, but also to confer benefit on medical practitioners. And to me, this reasoning seems to underlie the concern that seems that the ACNC seems to have about CPD. Fast forward around 73 years, and Queen Elizabeth is now a sprightly 75, and GMC applied for registration as a charity. Now, in terms of precedent, this was the same entity. And the 1928 GMC decision had been upheld about 30 years later in the GNC case, General Nursing Council, and while there was some New Zealand authority which took a different view about the purpose of regulation, there was no clear legal authority in the UK. In its published reasons, the UK Charity Commission 
considered the doctrine of precedent and concluded that it could re-examine the charitable status of GMC as long as there were circumstances which justified that. And such circumstances included changes in social and economic circumstances. In this regard, the Commission drew out the principle that it's well established in charitable law, charity law that what is regarded as charitable at one time may not be in another and vice versa. The Commission has ultimately found that GMC was now charitable. And what they said was that since the court had looked at this question, they had developed a broad based acceptance that regulation, depending on its nature, is necessary and in the public interest. That is, it is now viewed more as a means of protecting the public rather than protecting and benefiting those in the profession or those subject to the regulation. And I suspect the same would be said for CPD, particularly in light of the findings of the recent Royal Commissions. Going back to GMC, the UK Charity Commission did not consider that it was bound to refuse GMC's registration until told otherwise by the court. Instead, as evidenced by the quotes on the slide, it relied on the principle that charity law changes with the times to determine that GMC's purpose, which the court had said was not charitable, now was. And that's quite significant and an excellent example of how the principles extracted from charity law can be used by regulators to reinterpret the law in light of changed social, economic or cultural circumstances without waiting for a court decision before doing so. And when that approach is taken, charity law can remain vibrant and modern as the courts consistently emphasize it must. And Joe, I just hope it doesn't set a precedent that it needs to take 70 years before that can happen. Thank you so much, Marla. I'll again, I think. I'd also like to acknowledge the, tradi the traditional owners um, of the land on which we speak and their elders past, present and emerging. And I just wanted to comment that this morning um, I found the first session fantastic and I very much liked to listen to Monica and I learned so much. <laughs> I was a little bit overwhelmed, but my favourite part, I think, was imagining Melbourne as just land and where she spoke about this street here underneath all these beautiful buildings being a creek that ran down to the river. And I'll be thinking about that a lot um, in the coming weeks, I think. We've got a lot of work to do. So that was a wonderful start to the day. Thank you, uh, Marla and Seeking, for sharing your thoughts um, on how the body of rules, or to speak more formally, <coughs> I like to think of superstructures sometimes when we are indeed talking about a conceptual architecture. That body of laws or rules that is changing that regulates charities copes with social, economic and cultural change. Uh, I really appreciated those contributions on PBIs and um, CPD or the advancement of education. There's just so much to think about. And I know that we certainly do think about that a lot at the ACNC and have lots of robust discussions um, while thinking about decisions. While I'm happy to answer any questions that may come up either today or later, and as Anna said, please do get in touch. Um, I'll not respond directly to those presentations. We've discussed that I won't. Instead, I'd like to consider, again, um, at, at the risk of sort of making a bit of a point of it, how the regulator fits within this conceptual architecture and how individuals within the entity can do the very best job possible. I've been a public servant for 22 years. I kind of can't believe that, but I guess it's true. Working mainly in law enforcement and the regulatory space, let me say, is fantastic. Um, I also really enjoy being a lawyer and I respect that my primary duty is to the court. But I'm starting to think I'm first and foremost a public servant. Um, this topic today has prompted me to ask a few questions, mainly what is my role, what is our role as public servants, and what is the role of a good regulator, a great regulator, I hope, within a mutable space? 
like, for example, the development of the law relating to PBI and, and the advancement of education, where the boundaries are by no means set. I'm the first one um, to say that out loud. Um, firstly, I, I was having a think about what I was going to say today, and I stumbled across, across a, a great review of a book called What Does Jeremy Think?, it was about the career of Sir Jeremy Haywood, who was for a long time Britain's most senior public servant, and he died a couple of years ago. Now, he worked for four prime ministers, um, two Labor and two Tory. So we've got some balance there. He was revered by many on both sides of politics for his ability to be politically savvy, yet apolitical. I think that's extremely important, and I live by that. He was known to value diversity, rigorous evidence and ideas, and he believed that collective wisdom was critical. So that's another reason why I'm delighted to be here today, because there's a lot of collective wisdom. A review I read of the book spoke of his quite passionate belief in open government and in the sense, and the sense that he thought the days were gone when any institution, not least the public service, could believe, it's, could believe itself the font of all wisdom. I certainly agree with that. And I think that as we at the ACNC think about our revisions uh, to the PBI, CIS and the others that are coming along um, and all the legal issues that we deal with day to day, we'll be engaging in consultation and working hard to ensure that we don't ascend the stairs to our ivory tower as a regulator. I think we don't do that already, and it just gets better and better, to be honest. I've also reflected, as so many more eminent people have before me, on how the regulator should operate and ask the question, what makes a good one? Don't, don't all start at once. <laughs> all lines of inquiry, though, seem to lead, for me, to a few, to a few really important principles. At the most simple level, and thanks to an article I read about the ACCC, which I think is a very effective regulator, it can be expressed as the need to be trustworthy. And it's not lost on me that, of course, the word trust is in the objects of the ACNC Act. This means that the regulator, when it's to be trustworthy, must be independent of the government and the sector that it regulates. <laughs> we must have a proper and clear purpose. We've got our objects and we've, got a, and we've got a really good regulatory approach statement. And we must act within authority. We've got to be trusted to do the right thing. Of course, these principles are, are of equal importance, but I'd like to single out the concept of independence because as Commonwealth public servants, it's drummed into us that we must be impartial in order to maintain integrity. Recently, I watched a presentation by Peter Shergold and Graham Samuel and was struck by a great many of their arguments. They were really emphatic in their view that public servants must be impartial as that was the crucial to protect the public interest, a reason for being. Shergold said that the crucial role of an impartial public servant and an independent regulator is to maintain and restore confidence in the way our system of democratic governance works. High-minded words for someone in my position, but we all have a part to play. So what are the things we can do to reach the standards proclaimed in such lofty words? We've talked about them already today. Technical excellence. I'm the director of legal, but I've got some technical experts and there's a great deal many more in the ACNC that have that technical expertise. Knowledge of the sector, understanding the operations, pressures, drivers and incentives of the sector. I've learned a lot about that today and we're going to continue learning that. Pragmatism to achieve outcomes. There are many tools available to regulators and we need to use what works and what is, and what is, is best depending on the subject matter and the situation. We always take into account the situation of charities. Effective communication and consult consultation. I spoke about this a little bit yesterday at Regulators Day. I think our consultation is evolving. It's getting better and better, and I'm enjoying that very much. And whilst COVID cases surge, still I'm excited to be getting out and talking to people more. 
in real life or IRL as they say. But we're always working to improve our consultation and communication. Something that's been spoken about as well today is regulatory capture. I think we know what that is. But just as important is, I think, the concept of regulatory discord. This is when the relationship with those regulated is distant or confrontational. I'm really interested in that concept. And I think the key here is not to take the relationship for granted, but but we need to be keen to constantly learn more about the sector, what the sector needs, and I think C. King spoke beautifully about those things, as well as did Marla, and to consult widely and with specific reference to today's topic, to think very broadly about the structure of laws, rules, principles and regulation that, that we operate in as a regulator. To finish off, I, I think we're all here for the same reasons and they are to act in the public interest. And for me, it's about serving the community fundamentally in an objective and impartial way. This sector is part of the community, but it's the community that we're here for. Thinking as a lawyer, it's my view that this is done by heeding the important <coughs> principles of administrative law and operating within the system of common law and legislation. While on one hand, we're excited genuinely excited to be part of a changing body of rules that moves with the times. On the other, we really do have to recognise that as a regulator and as part of the executive arm of government, we don't and shouldn't make it. It doesn't mean it can't change and we can't amend how we make decisions, but we can't make it. Um, Professor Shergold said as well when asked, why do governments and why do citizens want regulators? I think they usually want them to be absolutely convinced that in our system of democratic governance, the authority of the executive is being wielded with integrity. That doesn't mean we can't change our mind. Take forward cases that may clarify the law, if the funding's there, and work with advisors and charities to be the best we can. But I will only speak for myself, although I'm pretty sure this is a sentiment many share. We must always act in the public interest. Thank you. Thank you so much for the three very interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentations. We're, we're technically out of time. I think we were supposed to finish this panel six minutes ago, and I can't actually see the audience, so I, I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, Ian? Uh, so I was just going to say, I think if, if people are happy to sort of give us five minutes of their time, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, awesome. There are a couple in the audience here. so. Um, uh, who, uh, maybe, Anne, did you have your hand up first? Yeah. Next, thank thank you. you so much, guys. That was really, um, very insightful. Uh, one quick comment and then a question to Sue King, if I could. One to Marla. Um, the education stuff is fascinating because you probably know, somebody made a maybe a throwaway line about this is CPD for us. Um, you might not be aware that when we first incorporated what was then the Charity Law, Australian Charity Law Association, ACLA, we were knocked back for, for effectively charity registration by the ATO in 2009. We subsequently then make an application in 2013 to the very, very new ACNC and were accepted as a charity. But it was exactly on that sort of issue. Is this a, an advantage to us? Um, and the, I think what got us, got us across the line was it was actually it was education in support of a sector. It wasn't just about our own, and maybe they just knew there was no money in it. So that was that was sort of the tension. But um, a question for seeking, if I could. Thank you very much for that that story. I just wonder if you, what your view would be. Is it time to legislatively drop PBI because PBI was a solution to a problem that didn't exist that the Privy Council was trying to do a workaround around um, you know state. Um, uh, revenue le um, legislation. Is it time to get rid of it? Um, I think there is certainly a view that is emerging around that. You know, so and um, I think also that if you look at um, all the heads of charitable purposes um, under our Charities Act, and you look at um, what is there in terms of the list of subtypes, you know, in ACNC legislation, um, I think PBI and HPC too, perhaps, you know, sits there somewhat awkwardly, you know, in that list of subtypes. 
you know, so um, I've heard you yourself say in the past, and you know, that is category error, you know, so, and um, yeah. Mm. And Jay, I think had a question as well. Thank you, Jay from Prolex Lawyers. Um, Marla, you mentioned about um, you've seen um, ACNC quoting New Zealand Computer Society case, and of course, I've seen some other New Zealand cases propping up from um, ACNC responses, such as Queenstown Lake and those cases. I do understand those cases may have some educational value, especially for academics and maybe for the court, but do you think um, those New Zealand cases play any role at all um, for ACNC? My personal view is that a lot of the cases that the ACNC are quoting are actually inconsistent with Australian law. And so I would say that really they should be looking at the Australian law um, as, you know, as authoritative. And I would add that, you know, um, I learn more and more as I look at the PBI CIS, you know, the current one and the proposed one, you know, so um, that we need to actually distinguish between cases that are about what is a charity and cases that are actually what is about a PBI and very careful about what we're actually drawing from, you know, each of those lines of cases. Mm. Joe, did you want to say anything on that? No. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, well, just given time, perhaps we, we should probably um, finish up there. So unless, did, have you got any questions online that you wanted to raise? None that I can see. Um, I don't know if, if the, if the um, helpful IT people have any questions that have come through online. Uh, there is none here that I can see. No. Um, uh, no Jess is shaking her head. No. And perhaps we can continue the conversations anyway. I'm sure this is, won't be the last word on these issues. But thank you very much to all of our excellent speakers for very thought-provoking and interesting um, presentations. And thank you very much to you, Ian, as well, for helping with the um, questioning. And perhaps you could all join me in saying thank you. <laughs>